record it was flash, flashing blue when Gordy was talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, when we start, oh, before we start, I'd like you to spell your name. We're not rolling yet. Bob's going to take this first. Oh, okay. Okay. Anytime you're ready. Jerry, would you give us your full name and spell it for us, please? Yes, it's Gerald Leslie Danforth, G E R A L D. Leslie is L E S L I E D A N F O R T H. My birth right. date is December 24th, 1946. December 24th? December 24th. Huh? Uh, Christmas. Yeah. Christmas Eve, huh? Yeah, what a package. <laughs> <laughs> and where were you born? Uh, right here in Oneida, in a hospital in Green Bay. Okay. And give us the name of your parents with your mother's maiden name. Eva May Schuyler and Leslie John Danforth. And do you remember your grandparents? Yeah, I remember my on my mother's side, my grandfather Jim and my grandmother. What's your names? Jim Schuyler was my grandfather, my mother's dad, and Hattie Schuyler. And what was her maiden name? Moore. She was a Moore. Okay. And what about uh, uh, your grandparents on your father's side? Yeah, well, I vaguely remember my grandfather, John Danforth. Uh, he died at a pretty young age when I was an infant or a toddler, I guess. My grandmother, however, Amy Skinnador Danforth, uh, we lived right next door. Where we lived was right between the two grandparents, so we are interacting probably on a daily basis. Okay. Do you remember the names of your great grandparents at all? Uh, my great grandfather. On the Danforth side was Jones Danforth. I don't remember. I don't know my grand great grandmother. And on my mother's side, and the names escape me. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Now, you can remember your uh, your grandmother on your dad's side. Tell us a little something about her. Well, she was a. Uh, a very good cook. Uh, <laughs> and a baker. I can remember uh, she took care of us often, you know, because when, when, both my parents worked when we were young, school, elementary school age. And uh, so she would do the baking sort of things during the course of a day. And of course, we'd come home from school trying to explore and find out what was baked during the course of that day. And uh, one instance I remember, <laughs> it's kind of funny, she had made cookies this particular day. So after school, she must have told my sister not to tell my brother and I, because we were both in school. And we, it was about a mile from where we lived, where we walked to and from school says, we're coming home from school that afternoon. My sister comes running down the road. She's probably about four or five years old at the time. And she's <laughs> she starts hollering out, Grandma didn't bake cookies today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it was pretty interesting. And you know, she was, uh, my grandmother Amy went to school at, uh, at Hampton, Hampton, uh, Virginia. And I suppose that's where she had learned some of the things about that kind of cooking and a few other things about things that she enjoyed doing. But uh, she was always a, a very kind person who would figure out ways of discipline, kind of without it being discipline. Did she speak Oneida? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah she spoke Oneida, as did uh, her husband John, 
and I think all the kids my dad's side, but they didn't with us. Uh, she didn't speak Oneida. What uh, what church did she go to? She was here at the uh, Episcopal Church in Oneida. Uh -huh. Very devout person, religious person. What uh, did they have running water and electric lights at the time? <clears throat> no, no, that was. Uh, I can't recall the years, but it was during all my, you know, elementary school years where our uh, water came from a well out back, a hand pump, and uh, lighting was from kerosene lamps. And I mean, that was her uh, and her family, and ours, ours too, was until probably I started going to high school. I think when we first in the house we lived in, where we had. Uh, running water and indoor plumbing and electricity. I think that all came about the same time frame, roughly. Now, was your uh, grandmother, did she have any hobbies or uh, things that you can remember that she did in the community? I know she would travel a lot with my mother. <coughs> my mother's job at the time used to take her up to Bowler, uh, and I think Menominee and other parts of other reservations periodically uh, in the state. My grandmother would go along during the course of a day and uh, uh, visit with people whom she knew from those communities. A uh, hobby specifically, you know, I really can't say if she had a hobby. I know that she, uh, regular housework and baking and those sort of things that you would consider household day-to-day -day, uh, chores uh, seemed to be her hobby. She worked out too. She worked for uh, uh, some families in Green Bay doing general uh, house cleaning, as did many, many uh, Oneida women back in that period of time. Did she ever talk about her experience at uh, Hampton? No, no, she never did. No, she... Uh, not that I can recall, not with me, you know, uh, that I can remember uh, specifically. What what type of uh, occupation was uh, your grandfather? You know, I don't. I can only recall what I've been told. I know that he worked uh, cranberry marshes uh, as a young man. He worked uh, doing uh, crop raising in the area here, haying and wheat uh, type of thing, working for working for his, his own land, but on his own land, but also working for other farms in the area. And I, I don't know, it seems to me that he also did some work, uh, lumberjacking work, but the one primary uh, job, as I recall, was a cran working at cranberry marshes. How, how big of an uh, area did he have for his homestead? Is he a new dealer? Is that what they call it? Yeah, him? I believe, yeah, that was the property there. And, uh, and it was about 50, either 40 or 50 acres, right in uh, ran where, what is now Ranch Road and County Highway H. That rectangular, it would have been a rectangular piece of property there. Those are most recent. They had lived in other parts of the reservation, but that was the area where they last resided. Who are some of your neighbors there? Well, as I mentioned earlier, my grandmother Amy was on one side and my grandparents Jim and Hattie on the other side. And then right next uh, across the road from my grandfather Schuyler's home was Clayton and Arletta Cornelius, and then next to them was Arletta's father, Foster Cornelius, who was a good friend of my grandfather. And they would converse regularly. Uh, and then further south, on the same on the west side of the road, next to my grandfather's house was Vernon and Catherine Jordan, and then the house after that was Hank Skinnador. And that was it for houses on the west side. I think across from Catherine and Vernon 
was a non-Oneida family named McKleinschmidt lived there and farmed that parcel of land. And then further down the road from Kleinschmitz was a horse farmer, or a guy who raised horses and had these trotting horses. And, uh, you know, their name escapes me. And I think it was Milburn. Milburn, yeah, Milburn. Uh, and then after them were a family named Hussens, I think, moved in there. They also raised horses. Yeah. And then on the very end of the County H, just before you get to the intersection of Fish Creek, was a guy by the name of Pouch. I, I can't remember. It seems like there were, there were two brothers there. I can't recall. The name Austin rings a bell, but there, I believe there were two brothers. Their name was Pouch, and they had they had horses. They had work horses there, and would do different jobs here and there. So that. That was our neighbors on the on the south end. And there was a farm right at the corner of H, which is uh, buildings are still there, but uh, I don't think they farm it. But that was a family by the name of Osmond lived at that farm. And then further north on that same side of the road was Ira Cornelius. And uh, across the road, going north, was Baptist Stevens and his family. And uh, there was Bob Schuyler and his family after that. Across the road on the west side was Leatris and Leland Polis and other families. But those were our immediate neighbors that we... Mm -hmm. we Approximately how many families would you guess there'd be? About 20? If that, yeah. But in that neighborhood, okay. yeah. I just wanted to get that set... Because right now... Oh, right now it's, it's, it's huge. <laughs> I'm not sure how many of them. We'll come back to yeah. that. Uh, all right, let's talk about uh, uh, your grandparents on your mother's mother's side. Yeah. Tell us, uh, tell us about your, uh, your grandfather. That was Jim. He was a... Uh, pretty hard-working guy, and he farmed land, uh, his own property there. I forget how many acres totally he had there, but uh, the acreage he farmed was probably 10 to 15, I'd say maybe 10 acres or 15 acres. Uh, but he also farmed other properties, and we'd do, because I worked with him quite a bit, helping him with uh, uh, equipment, because he had a plow and disc and cultivators and corn planters and what have you. Um, but we had farmed that land there and other farms in the area as well. I know we did some work over on John Moore's farm, like over on the way in the southern end of the reservation. And also, uh, I can't recall some of the other properties, but up, up near where the Methodist church is, I think it was Oliver Webster's property. I think he had some did some farming up there, plant. When I say farming, planting and harvesting crops. But uh, yeah, he he always had a plan of getting some kind of work out of me almost on a daily basis. Uh, and it would. He, he was a he was a pretty strict person, but he he had he had a certain he had a certain. Uh, Sense of humor about him also that it was it was kind of it was funny and and always, obviously kept my interest up. I worked with him uh, on a re very regular basis. Uh, Did he ever tell you where he went to school? Yeah, he went to uh, Toma. Toma in Wisconsin is a boarding school. I don't know for how long he was there. Did you ever have any comments about it? Not that I recall, uh, uh, but I I got the sense that he didn't stick around there too long. That he that he was, I don't know if he left there periodically or, you know, I don't know for how long he was there. But I got the sense that that uh, and it wasn't a place where where he stayed, you know, for prolonged periods of time. Uh, did he speak uh, Oneida? Oh yeah, yeah, he spoke Oneida. 
but he, he didn't speak that with me, so to speak. But when he and Foster Cornelius would get together, <coughs> they would speak Oneida um, regularly, and I could tell generally uh, about the topics that they were talking about because they had to intermingle certain English words into them to make their points. And I could tell when they were talking about me. I remember learn, knowing. I can't remember which one was saying to the other. Uh, he's trying to understand what we're saying about him. Oh, uh, what about your grandmother? Tell me a little bit something about her. Uh, let me take a short break here. Sure. Okay, we were talking about your grandfather. Uh, can we switch to uh, Grandma now? Yeah, my grandmother. A story about her, or did Hattie you? was. Uh, she seemed to me. I mean, just her stature alone, she seemed like a very tall uh, person, uh, and. Kind of like my other grandmother, you know, she's always busy doing something, baking and cooking and making clothes and making toys. And we stayed, we spent, kind of uh, stayed with my grandmother. We used to call them the other grandmother, depending on which one you're staying with, but uh, kind of back and forth during the course of a, a week uh, while my parents were at work, while we weren't in school. Uh, so again, we spent quite a bit of time there, as did some of our other cousins. Uh, and uh, my grandmother Hattie was always singing or whistling or going about her chores, and, and always a very pleasant, very happy way about her. And also a very devout uh, Christian person and her religious beliefs. And uh, what church uh, she attend? The Methodist Church, yeah. Okay. She was a Sunday school teacher and always uh, doing something with the church, you know, and uh, I'd help them, both her and my grandfather, doing cleaning of the church on the weekends uh, or during the course of a week, general maintenance and cleaning. She's um, an avid gardener. Uh, both of flowers and vegetables and fruits. So it's just something, I mean, during the course of the year, it's always some sort of high level uh, activity associated with uh, making food or raising fruits and vegetables or harvesting them and or canning them. And the cycle goes around, eating them. and. <laughs> Did she ever tell you uh, what type of uh, educational background she had? No, I don't recall that that she that was ever part of our conversation. And ever since, uh, that wasn't something I recall us talking about. Now, Grandpa Jim was, he was Oneida. He was Oneida. And Grandma Skander was? German. And she's part Stockbridge, not Stock, Brotherton. Brotherton, she said she was part Brotherton, but I, and I don't recall the rest. Okay. Did, did she ever talk about her side of the family to you? No, not, not really. I, I mean, generally speaking, we'd visit or be visited by some of her sisters, you know, Aunt Jenny. Uh, I, rem I remember her, uh, her and her husband, Isaiah, would be there regularly, uh, and her other sister, uh, right down there on, I can't remember her name now, uh, right down there on my Chicago Corners. Is it Aunt Ellen? Or? Ellen, yeah, Aunt Ellen. And of course her brother John and her other brothers, 
sim more. So there was, I think, quite a bit of interaction and social visits, you know, with those family members. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about your uh, mother and dad. Let's talk about your dad first. Uh, what was his educational background, do you know? Uh, fifth grade. To my, I think he went as far as the fifth grade. And where uh, did he go to school? The last school I remember was right there at Chicago Corners. Uh, I think he went to, uh, I think he for a while, at earlier years, he went to a uh, uh, Catholic school. I don't know if it was St. Joseph's or one of the Catholic schools in the area in Oneida here. But I think his last uh, school days were with at Chicago Corners. And then from there, I think uh, what he did in those early years, I'm not quite sure. I know he was involved uh, and joined the CC camp groups during that area. I forget when it was, uh, the, perhaps the 30s. Uh, and how many brothers and sisters did he have? Let's see. Carl was his oldest brother. Then it was him. And then Donald uh, and Guy were younger brothers. And then he had a sister, Grace, who died relatively young. Uh, the oldest, I can't remember if Verna was older than Carl or not. I think Verna was the oldest, actually, in the family. Uh, and then another sister, a younger sister, Exilda. Now he had uh, his. I don't know if all his brothers, but I know some of his brothers were in the service for for a period of time. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah, all his all his brothers were. Uh, he was in the. My dad was in the army. His brother Carl was in the army as well. And then Donald, <clears throat> Donald was in the army. He was a career army guy for twenty plus years. And Guy was started off in the Navy and then transferred to the Air Force. And uh, he was a twenty-plus year Air Force retiree. So. And your dad was in uh, what period of time? He was in during World War II, and then I think shortly after that was got out. Did he go overseas? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. No. And what kind of work did he do after he came back? I know he did some work uh, with road construction in different parts of the country, in and around the area. And I think they, I know for a while they had jobs over there near, uh, in Keel, where they're doing the curb and gutter part of the road construction. That was, I remember him talking about that. I think he did work in the area on different farms, like some of the names I recall was this farm, Bischoff's in Black Creek, I think it was. Uh, there was a... Bischoff? Yeah, Bischoff. There was a Wetley's. And I don't recall what Wetley's all did, but it seemed like it was harvesting of different types of crops, horseradish or sugar beets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... <clears throat> I can't recall the years exactly, but I would say somewhere around the late 50s or early 60s, he got a job with U.S. Paper Mill in De Pere, and that's where he eventually retired from. But that job, wow, that was a six-and-a-half-day-a-week job for him, every day. <laughs> a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of hours. Okay. Yeah. Did your dad speak Oneida? Yeah, he he knew, but he didn't. He wouldn't normally talk Oneida with us, but periodically, you know, the, the question would come up about something, and he would know what the answer. He would know the word, the Oneida words for what it was we were asking. Was he involved in the tribal government at all? No. Well, actually, yes and no. He wasn't involved in tribal government per se, but. He was 
I don't know if it was appointed or how it came about, but he was one of the first deputies around here, police officers, our constable. I'm not sure what the proper term would be. Uh, so to that, to that extent, I guess he was, would have been involved to a certain degree. Hi. What about your mother? Uh, did she ever tell you what kind of uh, educational background she had? Oh yeah, she's a high school graduate and she had interrupted high school years for uh, various reasons, I think, in, in helping out at, at home and uh, I can't recall the specific details, but I know she went through part of high school and then had to drop out and then return, I think, a, a year or two year or two later and finished up her, her high school. But eventually I think she graduated from Green Bay East High School. Uh, and then uh, and it, I guess that's about the extent of her, you know, like elementary and high school mm -hmm. training. She didn't go on to college. I think she took some diff various courses uh, associated with the different employment she had at the time. And uh, you remember the names of uh, her brothers and sisters? Oh yeah. The uh, the eldest, uh, there was ten in that family. Uh, the eldest was our, yeah, Pearl, your mom. Uh, my mother, Eva. I don't know if I get these all in the right chronological order, but Barbara, Evelyn, Rita, Harriet, or Hody as I've always called her, and Cleo. And, oh yeah, Aunt Mary. And Joe and Lester were the brothers. A pretty big family. Yeah. Now, about what time did... Uh did your folks get uh, get married? They get married during the war or after the war? It would have been after the war. After the war? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And where did Most they resign? Men, right here in Oneida. And there's a, there's a home now, one of the first homes, I don't know if there were others involved, but there was a home uh, just north of uh, Highway H and Ranch Road where Ira Cornelius once lived. And at some point prior to that, my mother and dad lived there. When I was, a matter of fact, just about a week or so, I was telling my mother, I said, yeah, I remember getting pushed down the road in this old baby buggy uh, when the road was still gravel. And, and I, I really don't remember that, but <laughs> I was teasing her. And she said, I couldn't remember that far back because I was just an infant then or something to that effect. But uh, I remember seeing the picture. This old kind of baby buggy, it was a big, huge thing. And it was a winter, our late fall, if not winter, day, kind of gray. <laughs> I think that buggy was the only thing on the road. <laughs> and how many... Uh how many children in the, in your family? Uh, just three. My, three of them? Yeah. And give us their names. Uh, Jim and Joanne, yeah, my brother and sister. And who's who's the oldest? Yeah, I'm the oldest. Yes. And then Jim, he's just a year and a month or so younger than me, and then there's a couple of years between between him and my sister. All right. What were your responsibilities at home? When you were small, oh, it was uh, all kinds of responsibilities from uh, house chores, cleaning up the home, and uh, doing dishes, and uh, clearing the table, setting the table, cutting the grass, and planting gardens, weeding gardens, uh, and various chores that might come up anytime we wanted to go swimming. My mother used to find various odds and ends for us to do to delay that 
course of action. Uh, she would always need a, one day I remember we were going to go swimming down to one of the creeks here. The water was, oh, probably two and a half feet deep. But I know she had this phobia about swimming and possibly drowning. So she, she, in order to, I sensed this, she didn't say it that way, but she needed a clothesline pole. So I think it ended up cutting about six clothesline, six little trees to make a clothesline pole, all of which took maybe a course of a couple of hours. <laughs> so I presume her plot was to delay us long enough by the time we had walked to the creek, it would be time to come home. <laughs> Where did, uh, or, or what was a typical Sunday like at home? Well, was get ready for church, and um, that took up most of the morning. Um, we go into church, coming back, and uh, a, a huge meal. Yeah. Hey, tell me what a typical Christmas would be like. Probably no different than what it is now. Uh, the gifts are a little more elaborate, and the trees, uh, the, the accommodation is a little, you know, different. But it was same type of thing, you know, getting there was a surprise and gift openings that would occur. Depends. Sometimes uh, we discover those things early or late at night, <laughs> so we'd be up early in the morning, like at one minute after midnight. Uh, but it was a, the typical surprise of, you know, Santa Claus was here and and uh, even when we grew to the point where we didn't really think there was a Santa Claus, we acknowledged that we thought there really was. <laughs> Did you go ho yawning at all? Oh yeah. Yeah, we'd go ho yawning at uh, on, on New Year's Day. And uh, I can't remember. We, we would hit the general neighborhood of what I described earlier, typically. Uh, and I guess of all the different things we would get whole yawning, the one most uh, I re recall most distinctly was uh, uh, Marina Smith, right around the corner, would have these square donuts for Hoyan. Instead of the donut with a hole in it, it was, it was a square kind of a donut. Yeah, it's kind of neat. Hmm. Now, um, where did you, uh, what did you, did your folks use any kind of, or your folks or your grandparents, use any kind of herbs or uh, medicines, uh, you know, if somebody got sick uh, that you can remember? Oh, yeah. My grandmother, Hattie, I don't know what they all were, but she had an herb and medicine for everything. Not a day went by when I don't think there was some kind of brew steaming on the stove. Uh, but there were different things that uh, they would get medicines <coughs> at different times of the year. One was a medicine most common, I think, a very common in the area was number six medicine. I forget the proper name of it, but it's got a purple flower to it, and it's a good medicine for uh, multiple type of things, but uh, primarily like uh, you get a stomach ailment or fevers, that, that number six tea is good. But she had these other medicines, two uh, poultice type of medicines that she had put in a hot kind of a, one was called, I think, a mustard poultice. I can't recall what else would be in there, but these hot cloths they'd put on, if you had a, a cold or flu symptoms, they'd put this on your chest. Uh, and then, those are mo two of the most common things, But and I can't recall the other things that she used, but she seems to have, seemed to have home re remedies for almost any ailment that would occur. What about the, uh, 
when the parents and the grandparents would gather, did they ever talk about uh, uh, the 52 cents of the New York claim? I heard it periodically, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't a, a common subject that was you know many more other things. But but I remember hearing about that. Okay. Uh, right. Where did you start school? I started kindergarten in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, I think about halfway through my kindergarten year, we moved back to Oneida. That was my first experience at school. And and um, where did you go when you moved back? Chicago Corners. Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, went through went to Chicago Corners until until the I think it was the sixth grade, and then the seventh grade we got sent to Seymour uh, Elementary School. And then in the eighth grade, we went to school at Crystal Springs. And that school today is a, is a house, is, is a home. But uh, it was then a, a one-room schoolhouse. So that was, and from there I went to Seymour High School. And when you went to, uh, you went from there then to what, uh, what high school, Seymour? Seymour. Seymour yeah. High School. Did there seem to be a, uh, uh, for yourself, did there seem to be a, um, you know, uh, not a culture change, but I guess, you know, a change going from a little school to a bigger school to a bigger school? Uh, oh, yeah, it was, it was exactly, it was a culture change, uh, no doubt about it. And it wasn't the... Uh, Perhaps some of it was the size of the school. I remember in the elementary school, of course, there was a lot more. There were a lot more students there at that school, but uh, every, it seemed like everything we did, we had to stand in line for. Whereas opposed to Chicago Corner School, things just used to seem to move uh, a lot more easier. Uh, we had our well, for example, in one room you had the classrooms were, were set up in rows. Fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. So you did things by rows, and, and there weren't a lot of students, so there's not a lot of congestion. And things were, I believe, pretty orderly. Uh, compared that to an elementary school where there were hundreds of students, things seemed a lot more chaotic to me and, and disorderly. And as I mentioned, everything... And everything you did involved standing in a line for prolonged periods of time. Uh, to get into your class, to get out of the class, to eat, to go to recess, to come back, all meant standing in lines, which probably prepared me for the military. <laughs> standing in lines. <laughs> During your high school years, were you involved in extracurricular activities at school? Oh, yeah. Yeah, from... Uh, the typical football, track, basketball, wrestling, uh, but also worked a lot uh, doing, because at an early age I, I did a lot of jobs working for farmers in the area, and that carried on into my high school years, so during many of those sporting events, uh, football for example, and, and uh, cross country, was the same time that corn was being picked. So you had to play both sides of the fence and uh, so well I, I enjoyed the sport but I also enjoyed making money and doing. You know, uh, what was your most enjoyable times in high school? Oh, probably the uh, some of the some of the classes uh, for automotive mechanics was one of those things I enjoyed a lot. Uh, woodworking shop, the shop type of classes I think were more enjoyable as opposed to some of the uh, scholastics that, uh, uh, history for example, I really did not like history and I thought it was one of those classes 
that you had to do simply to graduate, but it really wasn't very important. Uh, which years later, uh, I, I regret not having applied myself more, but but I, I still took advantage in later years of uh, the opportunity to study history a lot more in depth than what I did in school. <laughs> what was the uh, what was the re relationship between the Indian and the white, if there was any, in high school? It was pretty. Uh, well, it was you know I was uh, as I was mentioning briefly, part of the culture shock was going from a small school population to one with a large population. Uh, the other was, and we had non-Indian people in our grade school, but I mean everybody seemed to be on the same page most of the time, and and, and race wasn't an issue. At least it didn't seem to be, at, from our students' points of view. Uh, when we went to Seymour Elementary School, it was apparent that race was an issue. So that was something new to deal with, and, and what, what did it really mean wasn't clear to me. Uh, but it was obvious that we were looked at by, looked on by at least some of the other students as those Indians. Uh, and without, with rare exception, that was kind of the general tone in my mind as those Indians implied something that wasn't positive. It wasn't absolutely negative, but it wasn't positive. So it's kind of because it wasn't positive, it leads you and leans you to the negative connotation. Uh, there would be the rare, and I would say more rare instance where somebody would really do something or say something racially harmful. Uh, in hindsight, looking at that from school-aged children of that year, you know, fourteen or so years old. You know, what does that really mean? Uh, it, you can get off on a whole tangent about that subject. But that would be, that was more uh, the exception than the rule. Uh, and, and the ways of dealing with that then was pretty basically by brawn, you know, and the strongest person was successful. And oftentimes it was a matter of intimidating somebody into not being harmful in that way. And, uh, and you did what you had to do to kind of set the playing field level. And that's how, that's how our, my, that era of my elementary school was and kind of how the high school years were. When you finished high school, what did you do? I went into the Navy. Well, actually, I joined the Navy Reserves while, while I was still in high school. Uh, I turned 17 between my junior, or during my junior year in high school. And so between my, during the summer break, between the junior and senior years, I joined the Navy Reserves. And uh, so right after high school, I went on active duty as a reservist. And then following that act of duty, within several weeks, within a month, I, w I had joined the regular Navy. Uh, going into the Navy, um, overall, did you experience the same kind of um, uh, relationship in, in, the, in the different cultures as you did in the high school? Or was that a different? It was, uh, it was very different. Uh, it was uh, my first experiences were were that there were differences. I mean, you could tell instantly there were differences, and there were, were racial differences. But it, then, this is back in 1965. The differences then primarily centered around the black persons and the white persons. And I felt, I felt like, kind of out of the loop of either one. Uh, but 
the the non the the white community there wanted to look at the Indians. Well, you're you're just you're part of us. Kind of speaking, I says, you know, really, I don't really feel like I am. Uh, and and I think the the different black sailors that I knew that they didn't look at me uh, with difference one way or the other. But I know I felt very comfortable being friends with black sailors or white sailors, either one. But I did see a distinct and a kind of a surprising. It was, uh, I don't want to say alarming, but it was very surprising that there was a huge difference between the white and the black. Uh, I mean, you, you, you know, you learn things, you know, in, in social studies of the difference in differences in, with, with regard to race. And at, at that time, that was the era where a lot of riots, you know, r riots were occurring in Detroit, and New Jersey, and California, race riots type of things. But the, the general view was uh, not viewed upon to me as an Indian person as what I experienced in my high school. It was very different. It was almost like a burden was lifted. How many years uh, did you serve? Thirty years. How many? Yeah, Thirty. Thirty. Yeah. And when did you make your uh, determination that you were going to be a lifer? Approximately. I don't know if I. In what you know, there. I knew that after approaching the end of my first enlistment, that which was which in nineteen sixty eight. And how many years? And four. Four. Yeah, four years in then, and. Uh, I was still of the mindset I was going to get out and come back to Oneida, go back to school, uh, and that was the general train of thought I had then. There was a chief, I've never, this chief was an Italian chief, I can't remember his name, but he had been constantly trying to get me to re-enlist, in, in, and I'm like, no, and we had just came back from, we just came back from Italy, or no, Spain. We had been in Spain for quite a long period of time. We got back to the States. I was in Charleston, South Carolina. And then uh, the policies were, for example, at Christmas time, a lot of people take vacation or leave, as we call it in the military. Uh, well, persons who were married got kind of head of the line privileges for the leave periods. Well, the same thing would occur when you came back off of a deployment from overseas is those persons who were married would get the privileged time off and the single persons kind of had to wait till those folks got back and you could take your leave. And you know, I just felt like that wasn't really fair. So as this chief, is, uh, I, had, I had requested, I think, 10 days. And it, my, my request come back to approve. So the chief says, as he's trying to get me to re-enlist, he says, uh, well, he's wanting to know why I'm not re-enlisting. I said, well, here's just one reason. That's not the only reason, but here's an example. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, you put a request in for 30 days leave. I'm like, I only, I only want 10. So anyhow, I make a long story short, I put the request in, and it comes back approved. So he says, here's the deal. He says, you tell me you're going to get out, you're going to go home, you're going to go back to school, you're going to get a job. I said, okay. He says, I'll get you your 30 days leave. He says, you go home. He says, in two weeks, give me a call, let me know how you're making out, either getting back in school or getting a job. He says, uh, I said, okay. So I go home. <coughs> of course, I had other interests then, too, you know, and I, I did try to pursue job opportunities, and I just sensed that, you know, one of the things was uh, application on all the paper mills in the area, because that was, at that time, that was like the stable job market in this region. Uh, but I just knew that 
the opportunities of getting in there wasn't, uh, they weren't that great. So two weeks later, I called the chief back and said, okay, I'll take Italy. Because he had, he had held these three, uh, one was a, a assignment in Spain, another one Sicily, and the third was Italy. So I decided then to re-enlist. At that time, I still wasn't necessarily committed to a full career, but I was re-enlisting for another six years. And within about two weeks, I was on my way to Italy. So that began that began that second part of a thirty-year tour. When did you start a family? In 1970. 1970. I got well. My daughter actually was was born in 1974. But when I got married, my wife had two children already, Paul and Steve. So we had an instant family. Yeah. Must have been kind of difficult, or, or were you uh, on shore as opposed to sea duty then? Well, I was on. I was ashore then. I was overseas in Italy, uh, but uh, right at that same time, I got my orders from to leave from Italy, and I was on my way to Vietnam. Yeah. So yeah, that wasn't. Uh, but that was a kind of, you know, in, in the military, in, in the <coughs> Navy, that was, that was just the way things were, you know. So it wasn't, that wasn't unusual to have to uh, be separated from your family for long periods of time. I mean, it, it was, well, then it wasn't unusual to be separated, like, you know, your tour duty in Vietnam was a year. So normally, your separation would be for maybe six months at a time for some regular deployments aboard a ship. But the type of duty that I was going to wasn't aboard a ship, it was in a, what they call in-country uh, duty. Well, in your 30-year uh, uh, career with the Navy, you know, what were some of the things that stand out the most in your mind in reference to you know, your experiences, it's, you know, uh, over the period of time. Mm -hmm. Anything that you want to share? Well, there's a whole number of things that my primary duties, the first uh, dozen years or so, focused on engineering predominantly. Uh, that involved a lot of time on ships, uh, of a multiple type of ships, everything from one instance of a little 32-foot patrol boat uh, to the more larger ships of, a, of a, for example, a submarine tender, which is a repair type of ship. Another one, uh, a destroyer escort, medium-sized ship. But most of all that I did then involved uh, maintaining, repairing, operating, uh, engineering systems aboard aboard those ships. And of course travel. I mean, you're, you know, every two to three years you're relocating uh, someplace hugely different from what you might have been accustomed to. Uh, so some of the constant things are the systems you work in. Some of the different things are the communities that you go to. Uh, so those were, those were experiences that I think helped me adjust to working with uh, people from all over the world, not just, I mean, within the United States, because we had you know, many different uh, ethnic groups in the, in the Navy that make up the Navy, people from all walks of life, from you know, wealthy to poor to uh, intermediate, you know, social and uh, lifestyles. So I think that with the with the type of training you receive in the military, it helps you prepare and helps you learn how to deal with some of those differences. Uh, by the virtue of living on a ship where you don't have your own space a lot, you have to figure out how to live with those differences. Uh, and so a lot of those differences are cultural differences, religious differences, social differences. 
and so on. Uh, so I think that, you know, by and large, that, that has conditioned me and helped me to, to deal with things, generally speaking. Well, how big a family did you have then? You had two from your wife's previous marriage, and then you had... Yeah, four children. Uh, four children? Yep. And uh, tell us, give us their names. Yeah, Paul is the eldest, Steve is the next, and then Tanya is the only girl. Uh, Jay, or Gerald Jr., and Patrick, and Thomas. And Thomas was, uh, he died in Yes, sir. Yep. Let's take a break here. <laughs>